Up next, we will hear from two neurosurgeons, Dr. Amparo Wolf and Dr. Stuart McGregor. Together, this married duo will share a window into cases they see in their clinic and describe some of the tools they use to help patients in their Sudbury practice. A disclaimer that this presentation contains some visuals that showcase surgery up close. Welcome. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. We're excited to talk. While trying to come up with a topic, because there's many things in neurosurgery that we'd like to talk about, we asked our family and friends what they'd like to hear. And one common theme that came about from that was, what exactly do you do? <laughs> So our goal tonight is to talk to you a bit about what neurosurgery is and go over some common cases that we see on a routine basis and hopefully help you understand a bit more about what neurosurgery is. And after all, it's not like it's rocket science. <laughs> and at the same time, we will highlight some of the technolog technological advancements uh, in neurosurgery that are fairly new to Sudbury since we started here. So neurosurgery has a large breadth to it with various subspecialties. Uh, we deal with diseases impacting both the brain and spine, and that can include things like oncology, so tumors of the brain and spine, vascular diseases, so diseases of the blood vessels of the brain or spine, such as intracranial or brain aneurysms. There's functional neurosurgery, which is a surgical treatment of patients who have chronic pain or have movement disorders, such as Parkinson's disease also encompasses epilepsy surgery, there's pediatric neurosurgery, there's trauma, there's spine degenerative disease, so it is a very wide field. So today we're going to present three cases that we commonly see in our neurosurgery clinics. These cases all have similar presentations with symptoms affecting somebody's walking or unsteady gait. But in this talk we will show you that they have different underlying diseases. So our first case is that of a 65-year-old woman who works as a cashier. For the last three weeks, she's noticed changes in her walking with um, worsening mild left-sided weakness, as Stuart is uh, depicting here, impacting her face, arm, and leg. She also notices episodes of slurred speech. The second case is a 54-year-old woman who has difficulty maintaining employment. For several years now, she's noticed worsening of her gait. She finds she's slower and unsteady. As well, she has memory changes with difficulty retaining new information. And as a note, her entire life, she's had an above average head size. The third case is that of a 65-year-old man who works in the mines. He's been having unsteady gait or difficulties walking for several months at least. He finds that the left leg drags at times, but both legs are really quite stiff. And he also describes that he has burning of his hands and he feels as if his hands, he's just dropping objects. He's lost his strength in his hands. The main issue across all three of these cases is difficulty with their gait. However, there are subtle differences in each case that help direct us towards the different causes. In case one, the patient's walking is affected by left-sided weakness, which also includes the arm and the face, which then leads to slurred speech. This helps us localize the disease to the right hemisphere of the brain. So this is an MRI for the first patient that shows an abnormality in the right frontal region, which Stuart is highlighting here, and so do the arrows. Uh, and this is an area that's close to the areas that control left-sided movement. There are two types of scans here. There is one on the left where contrast was given, and we can see the enhancement taken up by the tumor, or it's enhancing. Um, and on the right, we can see swelling associated with the tumor. In case two, the walking difficulties are due to challenges, challenges initiating her steps, with her feet seemingly stuck to the floor and slowness when she's walking. She also has memory difficulties, and her whole life, as I said, she's had an above average head size. This points to a general intracranial problem or brain problem that we see in specific conditions. So the MRI here shows that this patient has very large ventricles. 
So these are the holes in the brain that contain and generate brain fluid. Okay, so this patient has a diagnosis of adult hydrocephalus, which sometimes people know or have heard of as water on the brain. In case three, the patient has difficulty with walking due to stiffness in the legs and coordination difficulties. His hands also have problems with dexterity or fine, mo fine movements. Considering both sides of his body are affected, this points to concerns with the cervical spine. So the MRI here of the cervical spine shows extensive wear and tear um, and evidence of pinching of the spinal cord with associated scarring or swelling, which Stuart is pointing out. This is in the area called the C3, C4 level. This is called cervical myelopathy. And his occupation actually provides a pretty significant clue. So people who have labor-intensive jobs, such as mining, can be, this can be associated with a higher incidence of this disease. So now that we know the underlying, what the underlying disease is, the question comes about of how do we treat it? And being able to treat people's symptoms and improve their quality of life with surgery is actually what brings us fulfillment in our careers. So our first patient with a brain tumor underwent a procedure where the skull is temporarily removed. And there's a video here that shows her brain under the microscope. We create a small window in the brain to reach the tumor. Recently at HSN and to Canada, we can use a special fluorescent dye called 5ALA, which can help with the removal of the tumor. Under the blue light filter, we see the tumor cells are bright pink. And as we approach the border towards normal brain, that fluorescence, pinkness disappears. To treat hydrocephalus in our second patient, the brain fluid needs to be diverted somewhere else. And this can commonly be done through shunting procedures, where we put a tube into the ventricle inside the brain and divert the fluid to another part of the body, such as the abdomen. However, in this patient, she underwent a procedure called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is relatively new to Sudbury, and we have a video here that illustrates it. So we pass a camera through the brain into the ventricle system. Then we navigate our way into the third ventricle and towards the floor of the third ventricle. When we're down there, we then poke a hole in the bottom of the third ventricle and then expand it out so that more fluid can flow through it and around the brain to be reabsorbed. We then examine this and we can see the billowing of the tissues, which indicates that it's successful. So for our third patient, the patient with uh, cervical myelopathy, the, the, the surgical treatment is to give space to the spinal cord. So we can approach, approach the spinal cord either from the front or the back. So in this case, the best approach is actually to come through the back and to remove the bone that's called the lamina and the ligaments that are pushing on the, scored, on the spinal cord. And you can see on the image on the right, this is after surgery, that there's much more room around the spinal cord and you don't have that pinching that's present from before. In addition, you can see it on these x-rays. So specifically the ones on the left, you see some bones here, but there's no more of that bone shadow here. When we do it, it can cause instability in the cervical spine. And so we often consider fusing the spine together to prevent a deformity from developing over the years. And we do that with these screws and rods that you see in the picture. Okay, so what are the outcomes of our patients? So the patient outcomes very much depends on what the underlying disease is. So our lady in case one, she will see improvement in her weakness and walking after surgery. But she also ends up having an aggressive brain tumor that will require radiation and chemotherapy to control it. And despite even that, her overall survival is probably less than one to two years. Our lady in case two should have significant improvements of her gait with the diversion of the fluid and may last her years of symptom relief. For case three and other patients with cervical myelopathy, the goal of the surgery is to halt the progression, so not necessarily to improve symptoms. However, there is a subset of patients, about a third to sometimes a half of patients, where they actually do see some benefit and reversal of their symptoms over time. So these are three common cases that we see 
as neurosurgeons on a regular basis. Hopefully we've enlightened you a bit about what we do and what our job involves and have answered that burning question of what exactly do you do? We are also excited to have highlighted some of the technological advancements that our team has brought to Sudbury to help manage some of these diseases. So now that you all know what neurosurgery is and what we do, all you have to do is go study some rocket science. Thank you. Thanks.